and capable servant of this story receives not merely one talent of silver, he receives five talents. Now, there have been a number of ways in which uh, the amount of money has been brought over into American dollars and cents, but it seems to me that perhaps this is the easiest way. Let us say that the average working man in America earns, what, uh, eight to $10,000 a year. And if that is a good figure, then basing it on yearly earning capacity, we might say that one talent of silver was worth in the neighborhood of $200,000. And five talents of silver would be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars in American money. This was a lot commitment of thought. The second servant that came before his master was not as capable, not as skilled and gifted as the first servant, and he receives less than half the amount of money that was given to the first servant. But even so, receiving two talents of silver, he received a sum of money which we might consider to be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $400,000 in American money. The third servant was the least gifted of all of the servants. And he receives only one talent of money. But even that is a substantial sum of money, something like $200,000, as I've already suggested. And if somebody were to suddenly drop $200,000 in my lap, I would consider that a financial bonanza. As I have sometimes said, $200,000 will buy a lot of free toes and beans. And so it will. And though this may have been a small amount of money in comparison to what the first servant received, it was a substantial and significant commitment of money. Now, the servants go out, and the Lord leaves. And the first servant is every bit as capable as his Lord estimated that he was, and he invests very prudently the five talents of money that were given to him, and he accumulates an additional five talents so that when his Lord returns, he is able to offer his Lord a, a doubling of his investment, we might say somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million. The second servant goes out, and although he had received a lesser amount of money, he also does the best he could with this particular amount of money, and when he, his Lord returns, he is able to report that he too has doubled his Lord's investment, something in the neighborhood of $800,000. But the third servant is the spiritual miser of the story. And maybe he looked at that first servant and he said, you know, he received five talents of silver. And if he happens to invest a couple of talents unwisely, he's still got three talents left that he can invest and recoup his fortune, get back the money of his Lord that he lost. And then maybe he looked at the second servant and he says, he has two talents of silver if he invest one of these talents unwisely, he still has another talent to invest with the chance of recouping what he has lost. But I only have one talent of silver. And if I invest this talent of silver unwisely, I may lose everything, and when my Lord comes back, I'll have nothing to give him. And so he decides that he is going to go out where no one is looking, and he digs a hole in the ground, and because these talents of silver may very well have been silver bars, silver bullion, he takes his talent of silver and he buries it in the ground and covers it up, and he says to himself, now it's safe. And when my Lord comes back, I will be able to give him back the talent that he entrusted to my care. Now, I suspect very strongly that at this juncture, the story is largely clear to most of us. Obviously, the wealthy businessman who went on the long trip represents our Lord Jesus Christ, who has left earth and who has gone to heaven. And he's been gone a long time, just as the master of these servants was gone a long time. While he is gone, however, he has committed to the care of his people, to each and every one of us, responsibility, opportunity, Talents, if you will, in that sense. Financial capital, something that we can use in terms of opportunity for his service. And the remarkable thing about the commitment that the Lord has made to us is that just as the commitment of the man in this story, it is made to us, every man, according to our several ability. 
he commits to us responsibilities in line with the capacities that he knows we possess. Try to imagine for a moment, and this will take a little imagining, but try to imagine for a moment that you are home tomorrow evening, you're watching the television set or you're reading the newspaper or whatever you do on Thursday evening, and the phone rings. You pick up the telephone and the voice on the other end of the line says, this is the President of the United States, Mr. Gerald Ford. And after you've collected your scattered wits and uh, regained your composure, Mr. Ford goes on to say, I want you to know that I am just about to fire my chief of staff, Mr. Donald Rumsfeld. And I would like you to function as his replacement. I want you to serve as chief of staff at the White House. You will be the man who organizes the entire White House staff. You will be my connecting line of communication to the various heads of the departments of government, you will be my chief of staff. I'm wondering if there is anybody in the audience who would accept the appointment. I don't see any hands. I don't blame you because I wouldn't accept it either. I just simply do not have any political skill, any ability to function in that kind of a responsibility. And I suspect if I tried to serve as the chief of staff in the White House, in a very brief span of time, I would have the White House so messed up and the country so messed up that very likely the editorial writers all over the nation would be demanding that I join President Nixon in retirement in San Clemente. I just simply do not have that kind of ability. And I am very, very grateful that the responsibilities and the opportunities that my Lord and Master have committed to me are responsibilities that are measured out to me in accordance with the capacities and spiritual gifts that my master knows that I possess. You know, I suppose that there is hardly anyone in the Christian world that I admire more than Billy Graham. And I am deeply, deeply grateful that there is somebody who is able to preach to thousands of people and to do it effectively. I'm glad that there's somebody who can appear on talk shows and do a good job. Somebody that can sit down with a president or a congressman or a governor and give him a witness about his need of the Savior and do it well. I think really that Billy Graham is in a real sense a five talent Christian. And if I had even half the opportunities that Billy Graham has, I would probably muck them badly. But my Lord knows better than to give me that kind of opportunity. And the responsibility that he commits to you and the responsibility that he commits to me is always a responsibility measured out to us according to his knowledge of what we are able to do for him by his grace. Well, when the master of these servants returns, there comes a day of reckoning. Each of the servants is called on review to give an account of what he's done with his Lord's money. And I'm sure that by this time, I would hardly need to remind you that there is coming for every Christian a day of reckoning. We've spoken about it already in an earlier message. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me just remind you of something that I know is familiar to most of you. That day of reckoning is not designed to determine whether we go to heaven or to hell. Whether we go to heaven or to hell is determined entirely by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the fact that we have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. If there is anyone in the audience who doesn't realize that, I want to make it very, very clear. The judgment seat of Christ is not designed to determine our eternal destiny, but it is designed to evaluate the kind of life and service we have lived while we've been here on earth. And there is coming at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is coming a moment of review. And so each of these servants report to their master. And the first servant is able to come before his master and to report that he has doubled his master's investment. And he receives from his Lord some very wonderful rewards. And the very first reward that the faithful servant receives is the reward of com commendation. He is commended by his master. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
And I am firmly convinced that one of the very finest rewards that you and I can ever receive is a word of praise from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You know, I've discovered as a teacher in the seminary that oftentimes it is beneficial for a teacher to single out a student and to commend that student when he has done something that is particularly worthy, something that is particularly good. And I've come to believe that if a student happens to respect his professor, that that word of commendation means more to him than the grade he may receive in the court. May I say something to the parents that are here? I have known of parents who practically never comment on their children's conduct or accomplishments unless it is to be critical. And I hope that you're not that kind of a parent. I suspect that you are not. I hope you are the kind of parent that will single out the worthy deeds and accomplishments of your children and will commend them for it. You know, my own mother and father have always had this habit, and even to this day, occasionally my dad will call me long distance to commend me on something that he feels is worthy, that I've accomplished. And you know, that means a great deal to me. And it will mean a great deal to your children if you deal with them in that way. It will improve your communication with them. Don't pass out compliments that they don't deserve. They'll see right through that. But when they've done something worthy, commend them. You know, I can't think of a single person in all of the universe that I would rather receive a commendation from than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it is a thrilling thought to think that someday I have the opportunity, by the grace of God, to stand before the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ and hear him say, good job, sir. well done. That's something worth living for. That is a wonderful reward. And that was the first reward of this faithful servant. But that wasn't the only reward. Not only is the faithful servant commended, the faithful servant is also promoted. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Promotion. Those of us who have had jobs know that one of the very finest rewards that we can have for a job well done is for our employer to promote us, to give us bigger and better and more significant responsibilities. And listen. I don't care how significant your opportunities to serve the Lord Jesus Christ have been in this world. When you step into the world to come, the possibilities of serving him are even greater. Do you realize that there is a world to be ruled? There are nations to be governed. There are cities to be administered. And the faithful servant, whatever his responsibilities here on earth have been, will be a man who can be promoted to greater opportunities and greater privileges in the service of his Lord. What a reward to be allowed to serve him in the world to come. But that isn't the only of the reward that he received. Not only was the faithful servant commended, and not only was the faithful servant promoted, but he was also invited into a fellowship with his Lord's joy. Enter thou in to the joy of thy Lord. Did you ever stop to think that in the kingdom of God, the happiest person in that kingdom will be the Lord Jesus Christ himself? You know that the Bible says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity, Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy companion. And if we are talking about good and faithful servants, our Lord Jesus Christ is the most good and most faithful servant that has ever lived on this earth. A perfect servant of God. And he deserves to be the happiest, happiest person in the kingdom of God. And he will be. And nobody can have all that joy. But faithful servants can enter into it and share it. And I believe that we will discover in the world to come that there are some very special joy, some very special happinesses, some very special forms of fellowship which are reserved for faithful servants to whom our Lord can say, enter 
bow in to this joy of mine. And that will be a very splendid and a very wonderful reward. But the second servant comes, and he did not have as much native ability as the first servant had, and he did not receive nearly as much money. But he had taken the two talents that he had, and he had worked as effectively as he possibly could with those two talents, and he had doubled his Lord's investment. And here is the striking thing, I think. This second servant, who had only a commitment of two talents, receives exactly the same reward as the first servant. He hears exactly the same word. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many. Enter thou in to the joy of thy Lord. You know, I find a tremendous amount of comfort in this. I don't have all of the opportunities and privileges that Billy Graham has. But if I am as faithful to the opportunities that God has given to me as Billy Graham is faithful to his, I can be rewarded just as much as he. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting for a single minute that I am as faithful as Billy Graham. But the principle is there. And you know what I like to think? I like to think that in the kingdom of God, when Billy Graham stands before the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ, honored and rewarded, that standing right next to him, sharing the same honor and sharing the same glory, will be a Christian that nobody has ever heard of before. Maybe it will be a scrub woman, and she spent most of her life mopping floors and cleaning buildings. She scrimped and saved her way through life so that she could send money to the Lord's servants in various places and give money to the needy. And maybe this woman lived alone most of her life, but because she lived alone, she had extra time for prayer. And she spent a great deal of time praying for the Lord's work all around the world. And wonderful things happened because of the prayer life of this woman. She didn't have merely the opportunities that Billy Graham had, but she made the most of the opportunities that she had. And in the kingdom of God, there should be, there should be, right next to the honored servants of God, rewarded and honored to the same extent, because she was faithful, just as they were faithful. You know, it's possible that there could be somebody in the audience tonight just like that, you don't have the opportunities that the outstanding men of God of our country have. And yet, in the opportunities that you do have, you give yourself to them completely for the glory of God. When the future unfolds, you will have an honor and a reward as great as it's there. Wouldn't that be wonderful if there was somebody in the audience like that? It could be. It could be. But there is a danger. It is possible that there may be somebody in the audience like the third servant. So the third servant comes to his Lord. And he says to his Lord, he says, Lord, he says, I knew that you were a hard man. You use the efforts of others. You reap where you don't sow. You gather where you don't scatter. And I was scared. I went and I hid your talent in the ground, and now here it is. Here is the talent that you committed to me. I want you to observe that the words of the master to this particular servant are in all respects the direct opposite of the words that he has spoken to the faithful servant. You see, whereas the faithful servant was commended, the unfaithful servant is reproved. Verse 26, his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I used the efforts of other people for my own advantage, and your own words condemn you. If you knew that, you should have allowed me to use your efforts, and if you were scared to go and invest my money, you could at least have put it in the bank, 
You could have given it to the exchanger, put it in the bank, and allowed it to collect interest so that when I came back, I might have my own money with interest. Let me suggest something to you. Usually, I think, it is not the five-talent Christian, not the Christian with many, many abilities, with a very great gift, who is afraid to serve his Lord. More often than not, it is the Christian who doesn't feel he has much ability and whose opportunities he feels are small. And he says, I'll let Pastor Cotton do the work. I'll let Brother McKnight do the work, or Pastor Lawson, or somebody else. But if I did it, I'd muff it. I'd fail. Very often, it is the Christian with little ability and small opportunity who hides his talent in the ground. But there is no reason for doing that. For no matter what excuses we may give to ourselves, we cannot give any of those excuses successfully to our Lord Jesus Christ. If we have any opportunity at all, that is also a responsibility which our Lord Jesus Christ graciously has given us and expects us to fulfill. The unfaithful servant is reproved. The faithful servant has been promoted. The unfaithful servant is demoted. Verse 28, take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. One of the tragedies, I think, that will attend the life of unfaithful Christians is that having not used the opportunities that God has committed into their care, when they step into the kingdom of God, they will lose the chance to serve him. Now, you know, there are Christians who are not particularly interested in serving God. Foolish, but nevertheless, there are Christians like that. And I'm going to tell you something, that in the kingdom of God, there will not be any Christian who does not want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we stand in his presence, our hearts no longer dimmed by the allurement of the world, our minds no longer clouded by the attractions of earthly life, we would give our right arm to do something for the one who has done so much for us. But that would be a privilege reserved for faithful Christians and denied to unfaithful ones. A man who has nothing really to show for the life that he has lived will lose opportunity in the world to come. From him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. Solemn moment, serious moment, serious fault. But then we come to the problem verse of our passage. The Lord concludes his words to the unfaithful servant, in this way, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I am not surprised that some people in reading this verse have drawn the conclusion that if a Christian is unfaithful to the responsibility that the Lord has committed to him, that when he stands before his Lord and is judged unfaithful, that he will be cast away forever into an eternal hell. May I point out to you, however, that that is not quite what this passage says. This passage does not say, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into hell. It says, cast him into outer darkness. Now, before I go a step further, let me reemphasize for you the fact that the principle that we wish to apply to this particular passage of Scripture is the principle that I stated at the very beginning of my message. No unclear passage of Scripture should be interpreted in such a way as to contradict clear passages of Scripture. And it is the clear teaching of the Word of God that those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ are eternally secure on the basis of their faith in Him alone. I know that most of you not only know this, but believe it, but 
Permit me, if you will, to reinforce it with some passages of Scripture. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. If anyone ever came into eternal judgment who had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that verse would be false. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believe, here, uh, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. You know, very often it is believed by people that although we are saved initially by faith, the reality of our salvation depends on how well we do the will of God after we are saved. Did you notice the verse that I quoted at the mass there? Our eternal security is based not on how well we do the will of God, but on how well the Lord Jesus Christ does the will of God. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him that sent me. And this is his will, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. You and I might have every reason to be justified to wonder whether we can accomplish the will of God in our lives. We have no reason to doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ will accomplish God's will for him. His will for the Lord Jesus Christ is that we might be raised up at the last day. I know that you all for the most part, agree with this. I hope you understand it. When we come to this particular passage of Scripture, we certainly must understand that the failure of this servant to do his Lord's will in no way affected his eternal security or his eternal salvation. May I also say that there is not the slightest ground in this passage of Scripture for assuming that this third servant is not a Christian at all. If we had not had the last verse of this passage, we would have assumed quite naturally and quite correctly that this third servant was as much a real servant of his master as the first two servants. The talents that were committed to the first servant were real talents, but so was the talent committed to the third servant. He had real opportunities for service to his master, just as the other two servants had opportunities for service. There is not the slightest suggestion in the passage whatsoever that this servant is somehow a spurious servant. He is a real servant, but he has failed. And we must face the possibility, the reality, that failure can occur in Christian experience. And to this real servant, the Master says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Now I can hear somebody say to me, but, Mr. Hodges, there is no darkness in the kingdom of God. And I would agree with you, 100%, there is no darkness in the kingdom of God. But may I point out something else? There are no silver bars in the kingdom of God either. No one will be standing at the threshold of the kingdom of God holding ten silver bars, ten silver talents. It is obvious that we are dealing with a parable. It is obvious that we are dealing with figures of speech. We are dealing with metaphors for spiritual reality. There is no literal darkness in the kingdom of God. And I would suggest to you that verse 30 is a metaphor. A metaphor of what? Well, if you take out a concordance sometime, you will find that the statement, cast ye someone into outer darkness, occurs three times and three times only in the New Testament. And all three of these times are in the Gospel of Matthew. The first of these times, I think it does refer to someone who is being cast into hell. The second time it is used, it could refer to that. And this third time, I submit to you, it cannot. Let me throw out a simple principle. Our Lord Jesus Christ had a number of very striking and very effective metaphors 
He used these just like most preachers use their illustrations. I use some of the illustrations that I have in one sermon and another sermon, if it is appropriate to that sermon. And I think that a study of our Lord's teaching will show that he used his sayings and metaphors in exactly the same way. He used the metaphor in situations to which it was applicable and for which it was appropriate. And if you will study the three places where this metaphor occurs, I think you will find that they have all something in common. In all three cases, the individual who is cast into outer darkness is in some way excluded from an experience of joy and fellowship. And I would like to propose to you that tonight that this particular metaphor is designed to be the opposite of the final reward which the master offered to his faithful servants. To his faithful servants, he said, Enter thou in to the joy of thy hope. But to the unfaithful servant, he says, cast ye the unprofitable servant out into the outer darkness. What does this mean? Well, I think very simply it means this. The unfaithful servant is excluded from the special joys, the special experiences of fellowship, with his Lord, into which the faithful servant enters. He stands, as it were, on the outside looking in. He's out in the dark as far as these experiences are concerned. And he is regretting his exclusion deeply. Most of you know that my work back in Dallas is with a small group of Christians, many of whom are Latin American people. Latin American people sometimes have very large families. And over the years, I have watched the fathers in our particular church, and I have discovered that these fathers have a very special kind of joy in their children. I remember that we have a little boy in our church named Raul Rodriguez. He's about 10 years old now, and I recall the night he was born. His father called me up on the phone, and his voice literally rang with pride over the telephone. He says, Zane, he says, I've got another son. So I went down to Baylor Hospital in Dallas, and uh, there was his father standing right next to me as we were looking through the window where they show the little newborn infants uh, there in the maternity section. And his father was brimming with pride as the nurse showed me little Raul. You know, I have to confess that Little newborn babies, uh, they don't look all that special. You know, wizened-faced and red-faced and puppy cheek. you know how they look. And they all look just about the same to me. Not particularly special, but try to tell that to a new father. Try to tell that to a new father. That little kid is just as special as he can be from the very moment that he is born. You know, I watch the fathers of our church, and I see that they have a very special kind of joy. And I don't know what that joy is about. Well, I do know what it's about, but I don't experience it. In a sense, I understand it. In a sense, I watch it. But in a sense, I am on the outside looking in. You know, I had a father tell me one time, he said, Zane, he said, now I understand how God the Father loved his son. Because I love my son like that. And I thought to myself, my, that must be a wonderful experience to have. What a wonderful fault. What a wonderful communion with the heart of God the Father is possible to a father. But I'm on the outside looking in, and I'll never have that experience unless I become a father. And I believe that we shall discover that in the kingdom of God, there are experiences that are open to faithful Christians, deep experiences of fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, deep experiences of his joy. And unfaithful Christians will be standing there and they'll say, my, that must be wonderful. I can see it, but I wonder what it is like. And it will be sort of like standing on the outside of a brightly lighted room and looking through the window and seeing all the joy and all the gaiety that is going on inside and realizing that you can't go in and join it. 
And I think that is what our Lord means when he says, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be tears shed, I am sure, over missed opportunities. And I am sure also that God will wipe away those tears just as much as he wipes away the tears of every other kind of earthly experience and hurt. But there will be no way that God can give back to the Christian the life that is wasted or restore to him the opportunities that were squandered. That joy, that reward, belongs to those to whom our Lord can say, well done. Well done. Many of you are young in the audience tonight, younger than myself. And even to those of you who are not young, I say this. Be challenged by this reality. Faithfulness is not something that is automatic in Christian experience. It is not something that will come just because you have become a Christian. It is something that you will have to decide in your heart, you want to be by the grace and power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let it sing always only for my king. Take my love, by God, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take my soul, take my soul, and I will be ever, only, all for thee. Ever, only, all for thee. Shall we pray? Father, we Thank thee for the challenge and inspiration of the scriptures, which are given for our admonition and for our instruction. There is no one sitting in this audience, our Father, at least of all the preacher, who is not well aware that at many times and in many ways we have failed thee and been unfaithful to thee. But our Father, we pray that not that you will spare us from all failure, because we know that is a part of life but that you will make the basic thrust of our life a life of fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would make the basic attitude of our heart an attitude of loyalty and love to him. That that would make the basic characteristic of our experience as servants of Christ a fruitful and acceptable experience. Father, we look forward to that time and that moment when we shall meet the Lord Jesus face to face. We know now that we love him, we know now, our Father, that we owe him a great deal, but we realize that when we stand with unclouded vision before him, that our hearts will go out to him in a way that they have never gone out to him before. And we pray that thou would help us to have the wisdom to prepare for that moment, so to live, that when we stand before him whom we love though we have not seen, that when we stand before him, he may be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we desire that day, and we pray that thou would give us grace to realize it by thy power and by thy working, for we ask in Christ's name, amen.